Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to Around the Nest as we Jay talk our way around the Toronto Blue Jays minor league organization. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler with the Lansing Lugnuts. Over the course of this week's show, we'll go from AAA Buffalo with Ben Wagner. We'll also check in with AA New Hampshire and Tom Gauthier. And A advanced in the Florida State League, the Dunedin Blue Jays, Al Hernandez and Tyler Murray will join us. And then Trey Wilson will join us from my Lansing Lugnuts. And we'll see what's going on in the Midwest League for the young Blue Jays farmhand. We begin this week in AAA in Buffalo. Ben Wagner, how are you? Doing great. Doing great. The club is playing well. Five out of the last six into the win column. No complaints, especially as Buffalo continues to pitch the ball extremely, extremely well. And it seems like every time we talk to you, you're getting ready for the next Sean Nolan start. Yeah, it really does feel like that, doesn't it? And just by happenstance with all the rainouts and double headers and, I don't know, oddities that Sean Nolan just lands on this day, but we always have good stuff to talk about with Sean Nolan, so that's the bonus for everybody. And we always talk about Marcus Stroman. This week, I think, gives us much more reason than the usual. There was so much scrutiny upon his start, with the Blue Jays playing out in Kansas City, Toronto media descended upon Coca-Cola Field, and he gave them a show. Anything and more that the fans and the media wanted to see from Sean Nolan, he delivered. Oh, I'm sorry, Marcus Stroman, he delivered. And, you know, that 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 start, indicative of what could have been, but you knew how deflating eventually it would become because as early as Sunday, Marcus knew that his pitch count for that outing would be stopped at 80. So what he was able to do with those 80 pitches, knowing that in the back of his mind, that he was only working within a given window of time, was even more impressive of what he did to the Louisville lineup in that six dominating innings. And one fly ball made it to the outfield. The rest, if there was contact, was hardly hit. The strikeout total, once again, impressive from Marcus Stroman, but the pure stuff with all five pitches that were working and dominating a AAA lineup for 20, well, at the time he was 22, and as of yesterday, he becomes 23. So for then the, the, the raw 22 that he is for a veteran now at 23 years old going into his next start, which will be Monday, I think he cast aside all the outside variables that could have completely derailed a performance for him. He put an exclamation point on an outing that he said, I'm as dominant as I can be. This is the time. If you need me, I am ready. And the Blue Jays just didn't pull the trigger. And they have made other other means. So Stroman, his, his mindset right now is the next time he grabs the ball, it's going to be with Buffalo. It'll be Monday night when we open a series down south in much warmer conditions in Gwinnett County. You mentioned Marcus Stroman just turning 23. We're going to speak with other broadcasters about prospects like Matt Boyd and Kendall Graveman. They're all older than Marcus Stroman, and there he is up at AAA and dominating. And the other fascinating thing to me is that there's the misconception that a strikeout pitcher has to use a lot of pitches. And as Stroman showed, no, you can record strikeouts and not throw very many pitches at all. Well, that's right, and he knows the fact that he's got to be very crisp in some of his pitches or ditch the ones that aren't working that night. And if he can rely on one or two pitches to get out, that's the most important thing. And if you get 10 strikeouts, that's great. But if he also pitches to contact, which that's really been the mantra of this pitching staff as well, even with guys that have swing and miss stuff, they're not afraid of contact. What they don't want to do is nibble and walk batters because that builds big innings. And Stroman is right right there in line with Liam Hendricks, who went 28 in the third without issuing a free pass until it happened for the first and only time last night, start off 2014. So the pitching staff overall has kind of got the same mindset, working with Randy St. Clair, the Bison's pitching coach, and they want to do one thing, and that's get outs, get quick outs, and get the offense back to the plate so they can hopefully have them to support them offensively. It's just fascinating to read the game story from the uh, the game yesterday with how Liam Hendricks pitched. And as Joe wrote, it was the Hendricks show. Okay, there's the first walk of the year for him. But four starts, six appearances, he's 4-0, and and it looks easy. It does, doesn't it? I mean, if it was that easy, Liam Hendricks, you know, could write his own check. But it's not that easy. But what he does in the strike zone, he only pitches from about the bottom of the kneecap up to the mid-thigh and he's only using the outside three or four inches of the plate. Nothing goes over the middle. His fastball, his slider, 
uh, mixes in a curveball and a changeup, you know, and then he can throw and locate all four pitches. If he's doing it with these adverse conditions that we've had in Buffalo, a wind that is just relentless, cutting from right field to left field, or earlier in the week it was going from left to right field as well, but it's just coming off the water and it's frigid cold, and the players are angry about it. People here that live here are angry about it as well, but they're I mean, everybody's just dealt the same hand. So they're just going out there and they're trying to knock the bat out of the batter's hands and being as aggressive as they can, knowing that the pitchers will have this window to use as their advantage. And that's exactly what Liam Hendricks and company are doing with it. And Liam it, does not have the most dominant stuff in this pitching staff. You could go with Stroman and what we've seen from Sean Nolan and adding velocity as well that we've seen recently this season for, for him. He's now got that kind of velocity as well, but he also has the big looping curveball as well to keep guys off balance. So this pitching staff, I think, is just turning in rave reviews and living up to the expectations that everybody had for him. I can read the box score, and it tells me that Hendricks had two pickoffs. But is it because his move is great? Tell me about that. Well, that's funny that you bring that up because how about this? Two pickoffs within the same inning on a frame that had no walks and two base hits. There you go. That's hard to do. The move itself last night was was very quick. Um, And and for him, you have to also factor in, you know, who's on the base pads and whether or not they were prepared or not prepared. Uh, Early in the second inning, in fact, Eric Kratz pounced on a little dribbler, and instead of throwing down to first base, he caught Andy Wilkins drifting too far in a secondary away from second, and he threw behind him as he rounded the back. Oops, that's boo-boo number one. Blake Ducote then got picked off by Hendricks. Jared Mitchell gets picked off after being plucked by a pitch on a converse call where he squared, got hit by a pitch, and then Hendricks just said, all right, went to a pause and then popped off the mound. It's a very good but crafty. He does lift the leg but barely, but it's it's the pivot in the exchange. It's not a full delivery with the arm over to first base. It's very compact like a catcher would throw down to second. So that gives him the advantage. You mentioned how the pitchers have the advantage because of the win, but it seems like that advantage is not harming Kevin Pillar at all. Now that he's got his bat going, he's not cooling off. Red hot. I, I mean, unbelievable. 13-game hitting streak, which is the second best in the International League right now, 20 for 50, so it's a loud streak at the same time, and he's driving the baseball. A pair of doubles last night, drove in three with Buffalo matching the victory and a lot of adjustment. And as he put it, there were a lot of struggles that got him to this point, realizing again that he is not the power batter that he thought he could become, but has to go with what kind of hitter he is. Works in the cage, tries to keep the the, the swing short and compact. And that's the product of really the last three weeks where he's gotten hits in 17 out of the last 20 ball games that he's played. And, um, you, you know, he's putting together a bigger body of work, more indicative of what Blue Jay fans have been able to track early in his career. As you know, you win league batting championships, you're going to hit your way to the next level. That's what happened last year from double A to get into triple A. From triple A then, that bat got him to the big leagues as well. Now it's about making the finer adjustments, realizing the kind of person he is at the plate, what he's capable of, but also staying true within himself and going out and getting after what we've seen the last three weeks is a true performance from him. And just because the offense is heating up too, I mean, his defense is, is nearly flawless and he's played all three outfield positions and he's going to get an opportunity again since Anthony Ghost got promoted uh, to play in center field once again tonight. Let me pair him with another player. And it's, it's easy to pair the two of them together because both Kevin Pillar and Ryan Goins were promoted up last year after doing great things, bursting onto the scene as middling prospects who required attention. Uh, Goins, flawless defender, probably even better than Pilar uh, with what he can do in the infield, and yet neither one of them hit last year. Goins did not hit this year in Toronto. You've seen his bats. Tom has seen his bat at the AA level, too. Now he, here he is, uh, back at the AAA level. How is Goins? Uh, small sample size, but last night I started to put it together a little bit more. Um, what I saw from a big league tape, and also just, you know, talking with Ryan, he doesn't feel like he's completely lost at the plate. Timing is a little bit off. But what I didn't see from Ryan versus last year was a little bit of the swagger and confidence in his at-bats, knowing that he's going to go out there and not only get three or four at-bats in a given night, what he wasn't able to do in the big leagues, especially since he's really got in the slump 
he knew that he only had one or two at-bats to try to save the job for the next day. And that's where I think he started to press and felt the pressures then of trying to execute quicker in a game and try to collect those base hits. Because late in the ball game, when you're hitting ninth, you may only be guaranteed three at-bats, or if it's a late-game situation, all of a sudden John Gibbons has the opportunity to go to the bench and maybe get a guy like Moises Sierra off the bench, and he's going to pinch hit if they need a big bat coming off. Recently, Juan Francisco. Um, you know, so then you're, you're shaving away one of those at-bats. So I think Ryan, over the last week, two weeks, really felt the pressures of trying to do as much as quickly as possible. And then, of course, that just didn't reap the rewards either. And um, now it's coming down to Buffalo, putting in the extra work and trying to figure out the mechanics of his swing and rebuild that confidence first and foremost and get as many as bats as possible and try to do it as much against left-handed pitching to, to be another indicator on where he is in terms of the barometer, you know, in, in terms of where he then can balance out his entire season and rack up as many as bats to get back to the big leagues. It's interesting you say that about confidence. I noticed that when I went down for spring training, Ryan Goins was nicknamed Go-Go with the lug nuts, and he carried that nickname on up. He was a high-energy, very confident sort of guy who brought a lot of fun and happiness wherever he went. And then seeing him around the big leaguers, he was very subdued. He was very quiet. And, yeah, it was, it was one of those situations where he was out of his element. So I'm eager to see how he does recapturing his old form this year with Buffalo. You know, it's interesting you bring that up, too. And remember, he's 26 years old in a very veteran clubhouse. So a lot of players have to, as they say, know their role. So, you know, if that kind of flamboyant, uh, exuding energy personality doesn't fly within the makeup of a, of a clubhouse, you know, that can be received a, a number of different ways, either immediately embraced or um, kind of shrugged off as too eager for a young guy going into a clubhouse. Now, Ryan had tons of playing experience from 2013, and then moving into 2014, I'm sure he felt more comfortable with that clubhouse. But I, I'm sure, you know, just understanding the dynamics of how the clubhouse is in, in baseball culture, first and foremost, you, you know, maybe he just kind of tempered it back a little bit. But I'll tell you, you know, he's, he's doing fist bumps and um, high-fiving guys coming off the batting practice and signing autographs for a group of our buys and boosters. Um, just a moment ago off the field as well. So that energy and I think that enthusiasm for the game has returned, and he knows that it's a matter of time if he does little things properly, he can return to that big league clubhouse. Good to hear. Hey, not everybody's Kawasaki, where you bring that same energy wherever you go, and it's utterly endearing wherever you might travel. Uh, talk about a mob scene. That was just a moment ago behind <laughs> home plate here at Coca-Cola Field. Of course, the number one sought-after autograph was Moon and Nori, and uh, – when he went into one specific spot, so did the masses. It was kind of like Tiger Woods walking to the 18th. Uh, the, the swarm of people and media just kind of gravitate right along with him. So as Kawa goes, so does the rest of, uh, of the student body, so to speak. I love it. Here's our question of the week this week, because we have closed that April. We are into May. May 1st, Marcus Stroman's birthday. He enjoyed himself. And maybe he or maybe Liam Hendricks is the answer to this question, but a two-parter. Who carried the Buffalo Bisons in April, and who do you now expect to step up come May? Well, in April, offensively, Dan Johnson is a dangerous bat in the Buffalo lineup. Hasn't had really the hot streak of home runs that he can be very capable of getting. He's hit 30 home runs in this league. He's had also seasons of 27 and 28. He had 23 last year. But he's a dangerous but yet very disciplined hitter. So he'll work a walk but he can also change the dynamic of a game with a three-run home run. But having him in the lineup and batting fourth night in and night out is a dangerous bat. Um, you know, Chris Getz as well was very good when he was in Buffalo, swiping bags, always uh, a thorn in the side of a pitcher because of what he is able to do and the reads that he gets when he's on base. And you saw already the rewards of that at the big league level last night with a couple of swipes, and he's already got four hits being in the big leagues less than 72 hours. So those are the kind of things we also saw offensively from Chris Getz. Those are really the two main cogs um, in, the, in the month of April. But on the mound, Liam Hendricks, I think, is going to be your answer. 4-0 start, and Marcus Stroman was right there with him as well. Didn't ever have to really worry about harnessing the pitch count or getting too elevated in terms of pitch counts early in the season with either of those guys. 
they went out, they gave you an opportunity for a quality start and gave you a shot to win the ball game. So those are the guys that I really think um, from the month of April are going to be kind of the, the quattro right there. Moving forward to May, I think it raises more questions whether or not Marcus Stroman will have um, an impact, to, to have an impact in Buffalo. It depends on what happens in the big league rotation. So I'm going to go with Sean Nolan as the impact player to watch for the month of May in terms of our rotation. From the bullpen, Neil Wagner is somewhat of a question mark, only in terms of how long can he stay here and continue to rack in saves. He's already 3 for 3 and 19 for 19 coming back to the International League. And then at the plate, for me, it's going to be the guys like Jonathan Diaz, who returns from the big leagues, and Ryan Goins, and Darren Mastriani as well, who now occupies the leadoff slot. So those are the couple of guys that I'm really going to watch over the next four weeks and, and see what kind of role or rules they provide offensively and on the mound for the herd. Beautiful. Ben Wagner, the voice of the Buffalo Bisons. Go to bisons.com to follow along with all the latest from the herd. And meanwhile, you can find Ben on Twitter, at BenWag247. Ben, thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. Talk to you next week from Charlotte. Looking forward to it. Let's go on down the ladder now to Class A Advanced Florida State League. I believe Al Hernandez is with us. Al, is that you? That is me, Jesse. How are you doing today? Doing very well. All right, let's check in with Dunedin. Okay, you boys have suffered a couple of losses. This is odd. <laughs> this is this is a little bit new, and yet the D-Days continue to hit. They continue to pitch. What's the latest? Two losses in the last two days have been a bit disorienting. I don't know how to cope with it, so it's been a little difficult. But we still do stand at 20-7. Uh, over the last two days, I'll say that it's re- the offense has just been struggling a little bit, and you might be able to attribute that to Dwight Smith Jr. being absent from the lineup the last two games. Uh, in Lakeland, in the middle game on Tuesday, he went sliding into third on a triple, stand, uh, head first. He was on the ground for a little bit, stayed in the game, but he – but the next two days, he's missed. But he was supposed to be back in the lineup today. But unfortunately, we have just postponed the game. So I actually just got in here from pulling tarp. Oh, how is that? How's your energy level? Oh, I am always top-notch energy level. I think you witnessed that firsthand, and everybody in the office always knows that. We're speaking with Al Hernandez on Around the Nest. Al and Tyler Murray are the voices of the Dunedin Blue Jays. As we go our way, all along the Toronto Blue Jays minor league organization, this is the A advanced level, and the Dunedin Blue Jays, well, they've been the class of the Florida State League so far. Now, we have had some questions written into Bluebird Banter via SB Nation. We've partnered up with them this year. And some questions via Bluebird Banter. So checking in with you, first and foremost, it's taken a little bit of time for Daniel Norris to dominate like this year, and yet now he's dominating. So what's working out for him? He's really had all of his pitches going, and in his last start, I'd say mostly it was his changeup. He's been a guy that's relied on, and you know firsthand, his fastball and his curveball, which are, in my opinion, and I think in most scouts' opinions, his top two pitches. But he does have that third pitch, which is the changeup, and he was commanding it all over the plate the other day in Lakeland, and he was actually relying on it more than his curveball for his secondary pitch. Uh, He still is on the pitch count that's keeping him from going seven, possibly eight innings, but in those five or six innings that he's pitching, he's obviously, you can see his numbers, he's been dominating. Uh, And we always were giving Matt Boyd all the praise, but really the only difference between Boyd and Norris is that Boyd is at the point in his career where he can go a little bit deeper into games, but really he hasn't outdone Norris all that much. And even though we lost Matt Boyd, we're extremely happy that we still have Daniel Norris going. Well, Norris is looking good on the mound. We've seen how Taylor Cole has been, Jesse Hernandez strong again recently. The growing buzz has been about your leadoff man. Dalton Pompey is getting a ton of prospect attention. When did you start to realize, oh, this might be a special year? Helium is what is being spoken of with him. Light bulb moments. Pompey is capturing the news. I'll say from day one, he's impressed here. We all knew the potential he had coming into the year, but he has just blown us away from day one. 
He collected a few hits on opening night, and he hasn't looked back. He's tied for the league lead with 14 steals. And you know what? He hasn't even been caught one single time this year. He leads the team in average and on base percentage and slugging. He has just been lights out in the field as well, making spectacular catches in our last series in Tampa. Very big outfield. He robbed a few extra base hits. And as I'm sure everyone knows, he was recently awarded the 2013 Rawlings Gold Glove Award for center fielders where Pat O'Connor, president and CEO of Minor League Baseball, was on hand to present him with the award. But I'd say that he's produced from day one, and even though we weren't expecting this kind of season coming into the year, there was no one moment in the season this year where we went, boy, he's special because he's it's been on display since opening night. It was fun. Last year, when Dalton Pompey did not commit any errors for the Lansing Lugna, there was one play he made where he misread a line drive right at him. I forget whether he broke in and the ball was behind him, broke out and the ball was in front of him. I think it was the first. He comes in, the ball was hit over his head, he went back out, he jumped, he knocked it up with his glove, could not quite hang on, and as he fell down to the ground, he barehanded it. It was out of nowhere. It was one of the few times that he ever misread a line drive, and yet still, Dalton Pompey was not going to let that baseball fall. And in speaking with him last year, he continually told me he's working on maturing, he's working on getting the mental side of the game right. So we're only a month in, and yet everybody here in Lansing who saw him work so hard, there has been joy to see just how much it is all paying off this season. And he's reiterated that point to me in conversations about the mental side of the of baseball. He said that he was always very hard on himself, in negative ways, and obviously he's still hard on himself, always expecting better, but he says that he's still, or he's realized now that he also needs to focus on the positive and what he's doing well, and so that way that way he can build up the confidence, so that way when he's harsher on himself in the aspects that he needs to improve on, that he's not always just down in the dumps. He still is realizing how good of a ball player and the potential that he has. This is Al Hernandez, voice of the Dunedin Blue Jays, joining us on Around the Nest. I'm looking at the Florida State League lead, uh, league leaders in various important categories. Dunedin has a 2-2-6 ERA as a team. That is .5 better than the second-place squad. That's exceptional. So Kendall Graveman gets moved up from the lug nuts where he had only allowed two runs, one earned all year. And then he got hit around a little bit. He gave up eight hits, gave up four runs, two earned. You got your first impression of Kendall. We know here in our hearts he's going to be just fine with you. But what did you think? He's a sinker ball pitcher. He, those types of pitchers typically pitch to contact. That's what Kendall Graveman does. And eventually and occasionally – a sinker ball pitcher will just have nights where the baseball finds holes, and that's what it was. I wouldn't say that he looked bad on the mound. He had a little trouble putting away hitters once he got two strikes on him. They would battle, and then they'd hit a ground ball that just happened to find a hole. Nothing against Kendall. They weren't hard hit balls. They were just finding the spaces and getting down. And he did His shortstop did commit two errors on one play, Jorge Flores, It was a good play to get to the ball. He bobbled it and then made a throwing error. So that's why he had two runs unearned in the first inning. But I'm not worried, especially because you, Jesse, hold him in such high esteem. I know I can trust you. And I'm just excited to see him pitch again and try to pick himself up because, once again, he didn't look bad. The baseballs just had eyes that day. Well, the Mississippi State guys are back together, too. And how good has Chad Girado been for you? Chad Gerardo has yet to allow an unearned earned run this season. He has allowed an unearned run, but he's been a light out. You know that when he enters the game, you're in good hands. That funky delivery, the sidearm lefty, you'd think he'd be a lefty specialist, but he can go two or three innings and face righties, lefties, whoever you want to throw up there, and he's getting everyone out. Our question of the week this week, with the end of April and the start of May, so – Tell me, who was it who carried Dunedin in the first half, in the first month of the year? I've got an idea of one name that you might mention, a guy who's no longer with you. And who do you look to step up come May? It's 
difficult to overlook Matt Boyd. Obviously, he's, he's no longer with us. He's in Double A, uh, but he was the heart and soul of this pitching rotation. Every time he went out there, it was a sight to behold. And we already mentioned Dalton Pompey, so I'll try to steer away from him a little bit and say Dwight Smith Jr. I mentioned him how he was been missing at the top of the lineup, so and that has affected the team. So we're looking for him to get back out there. He was phenomenal. Everybody knows about the two home runs against Cole Hamels. But he's been a spark at the top of the lineup. And in the second half of the month, drawing 13 walks when he didn't draw a walk in his first seven games, I believe it was, all of a sudden he just started becoming very patient, working the count, and reaching base a lot. So I'd say that he was someone that you have to credit a lot of the success of April for this team to. Going into May, looking forward who do, I, who do I expect to break out? I'm going to go with Derek Chung, a guy who's now in his second season here in Dunedin. Got off to a hot start and then cooled down a little bit, hit a stretch where he was only three for 30, but he stayed as solid as ever behind home plate. And he's a, a true professional, a guy that does not let his hitting woes affect, affect him in the other aspects of the game. And he's been showing some sparks and some life at the plate recently, and I'm just waiting for him to bust out. I feel like that way about both of your catchers, with Derek Chung and with Mike Reeves. You've seen Reeves more than I have. But in speaking with the guys who are here who worked with him last year, in Sal Fasano, they all seem to believe that they found something special with Michael Reeves. And I heard the same thing about Derek Chung last year, that when that spot opens up above in New Hampshire, when A.J. Jimenez, staying healthy, continuing to hit, playing fine defense, gets the call up to AAA, and very likely Jimenez might make his Major League debut sometime this year, but Chung and Reeves, or Chung and or Reeves, will have that opportunity to head on up to AA as soon as this year. Those catchers, they're doing their job. Maybe their offensive numbers don't jump off the page as of yet, but we need to give them, it seems, a great deal of credit for how good the Dunedin pitchers have been. Often overlooked when you credit the pitching staff, you credit the individual pitchers, you credit the pitching coach, and Daryl Knowles deserves all the credit in the world. But you're right, the catchers can be overlooked, and I know that these pitchers love to throw to either catcher. It doesn't matter who they're throwing to. They trust both, and this and this coaching staff trusts the catchers to handle the pitchers well. Excellent. And my final question for you, Al, Gustavo Pierre is one of those guys who when you watch him play, just watch him for a couple of seconds, and his talents leap right out at you with how quickly he runs. His gun, he can throw it as hard and as smoothly as anybody else, and the ball can jump off his bat. When he goes cold, he'll go really cold at the plate, but it looks like recently he started to heat up. He has been heating up. He's gone through a couple of hot spurts this season, mixed in with the cold streaks, as you said. Uh, he leads the team. He's has three, he has four, rather, three-hit games this season that leads the team. And you're right, when he gets hot, he gets hot. He hit eight, he hit safely eight times in three games recently. So when he heats up, he's a force to be reckoned with. He's just still a guy that you go out there and you watch him, and he just still looks so raw. The talent is so evident. You know that he has the connects with a baseball. It can go a long way. You mentioned his arm. It is a cannon. He can make any throw on the diamond at any time. He just still is a young ball player that's still learning the nuances of the game. But if he's able to get everything to click at the same time, boy, watch out. Al Hernandez, voice of the Dunedin Blue Jays with Tyler Murray. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you, Jesse. Always a pleasure. Now, we have some time. Tom Gauthier will join us from AA New Hampshire. But Tom is right now, he's been called in to do a pregame interview. He's a little bit busy. Now, there have been a number of questions sent in. We have Bluebird Banter, SB Nation, about my Lansing lug nuts. So let's go over some of those questions. Uh, for example, it's taken time for Norris to dominate. We spoke about that a little bit. But somebody writing in about Norris, that was forced that the uh, Lugnuts forced Norris to focus on his secondary stuff last year, writes this commenter. Numbers weren't great in the early going. It seemed to really help him develop as a pitcher. He was excellent as the season went on. So the question is, 
Are the Jays taking the same approach for this year's crop of young pitchers at Lansing? And my answer would be yes and no. And the no only refers to the secondary stuff that will come. And yes, they work very hard on that. Daniel Norris last year worked very hard on perfecting his slider. But it all begins with the fastball. And a lot of these pitchers come to the lug nuts, and that fastball command just needs to be a little bit sharper, tightened up even more. Norris needed to work on getting that fastball and getting it down, getting it knee height, getting it to the outside corner. And once he could get that fastball where he wanted, then they worked from there. Vince Horseman is the lug nuts pitching coach, and he works entirely off the fastball. So Norris with the fastball last year, the years prior to him, Sean Nolan, Noah Syndergaard, Justin Nicolino, Aaron Sanchez, fastball command had to be where it started before you even worry about the changeup and the breaking stuff. But I was watching a bullpen earlier today. Tom Robson is a pitcher whom I know a lot of folks have expressed consternation about how well he's performed this year, especially after how he excelled last season, native of British Columbia, struggling with the lug nuts. In one outing at Beloit, he didn't even get out of the first inning. Robson has really worked hard working in the bullpen with the Horseman. Fastball command first, and now adding in a slider into a repertoire that already uh, consists of a changeup and a curve. He throws hard. He's smart. He understands pitch progression. And he put it together this past week. Robson was on the mound facing against the first-place Dayton Dragons, affiliated with the Cincinnati Reds. And there he was, dominating for the first time this year. What Rob Fay got to see last year in Vancouver, that's what we finally got to see with Robson here in Lansing in the dying days of April. Six innings, three hits, one run. He struck out four. And then Alberto Torado comes out in the series finale last night. He goes five innings, only one hit and one run allowed. Torado is putting it together. So I'd say to that commenter, yes, what you saw last year from Daniel Norris, we are going to see that this year with Tom Robson, with Toronto. Chase DeYoung seems a little bit ahead, but DeYoung, not as much as those other guys, works off a sinker. Young's fastball elevates it up in the zone and works with a 12-6 to curve. He gives up many more fly balls. Robson and Toronto are going to be outstanding as this year continues. Harold Laborde, meanwhile, has been transferred back to extended spring. He was uh, having struggles with his mechanics. And so we expect that once Laborte gets all straightened out, maybe he returns to Vancouver. Laborte last year spent the entire season in Bluefield, or maybe he comes back to Lansing. But he shows great talent. He works downhill. And he'll be back in Lansing soon enough. And then he'll be back on his way up the ladder as well. Like that's recently received Shane Dawson. Dawson worked, uh, walked five batters in an inning and two-thirds yesterday. Even those guys who are noted for their command – it wasn't quite there. So we expect, as this year goes, they'll tighten things up, and they'll be ready to go, and you'll see the improvements occur. I'll get back to the questions for Lansing shortly, but now let's bring in the voice of the AA New Hampshire Fisher Cats, Tom Gauthier. Tom, how are you? Uh, better late than never, Jesse, I guess. It's uh, sunshine. We're trying to get a few extra rays and work on that tan today. Hey, I understand perfectly. Well, what's the latest with New Hampshire? Well, you know, the uh, the big thing right now is we're starting to win some ball games, and a, a big part of that is uh, solid defense. I was just talking with our man, we meet you about that, and he said that uh, surprise number one, the thing that he's been most pleased with has been the defense, but in particular the outfield defense. Uh, and the other big thing, starting pitching has been good all season, but the bullpen uh, is finally coming around only a in the last 50-odd innings, uh, the ERA has been about two over the last uh, two, two-and-a-half weeks. And when you had a bullpen that had an, ER, had an ERA of six-and-a-half for the first two weeks of the season, awful tough to win ball games. And now they're starting to, to right the ship, and they've been really good the last couple of weeks where they've gotten in a little bit of trouble, but they've been able to get out of it, and things haven't snowballed on them. And, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, we go seven and three over a 10-game stretch. Isn't that weird how it works? Suddenly guys start performing, and those wins come especially with the importance of the bullpen. Did they always feel like they could be strong, like they could be a solid outfit, and just the results weren't there early on? You know, and I think if you look back to what they did last year when they were in Dunedin, they were a strong outfit last year, but they had guys that would give up a few walks and then they'd battle their way out of it. And they were doing that early on here, but I think they realized 
two things. Number one, and this was something that Jim Sykowski and, and Meacham had said from the beginning, that guys weren't being aggressive enough. They were trying to be too cute around the strike zone. They just weren't throwing 95 or 96 like Tyler Yabara can do. He's trying to be a, a little cuter and trying to you know, almost pitch a little bit more, but, but not pitch the right way. So I think that the bullpen had confidence, and I think that Bobby from firsthand experience knew that these guys – could get the job done, but it was a matter of just getting him in that right frame of attacking mindset as opposed to, you know, not being intimidated, but, you know, that's what it almost seemed like. They, they were soft. They came out, you know, kind of slow out of games, and they fell behind, and, and you know, they really got snowballed, uh, made things a lot worse. They're still getting behind a lot. They haven't been great with that first batter of an inning, but they've been able to overcome the first batter if he gets on. It's not been a big deal. They, they get the next guy, and they just move right along. Tell me about working with Big Sai, moving up from Vancouver. How's he been this year as your pitching coach? You know, it's actually funny, Jesse, because all three guys on this staff uh, could could not be more alike uh, in a lot of the way that they go about their business. They're all laid-back guys. They'll talk to you about anything that they like to talk about the game, all very upbeat guys. There's none of that. Uh, you know, and baseball is a, a sarcastic, cynical game at times. There's none of that with these guys. They're really, really positive guys, and, and Jim is the front runner there. He's a, he's a great guy off the field just by some of the work that he does in the community. And I'm sure the folks in Vancouver can attest to that as well. So uh, but, you know, he's been, he's been really good. He's, he's willing to talk to you if you have any questions on anything. And uh, even, you know, even if a guy's struggling, it's not, oh boy, look out. It's uh, it always keeps it positive, which is uh, again, not that that wasn't the case in the past with coaches, but that's the way the, the game of baseball goes. You do get a little sarcastic and cynical at times. And, and through the first month, Jim hasn't been like that at all. He's been very upbeat and very positive. Joined by Tom Gauthier, the voice of the New Hampshire Fisher Cats, double A affiliate for the Toronto Blue Jays. Tom, as we close April and now we are into May, who carried your team in the first month? And the second part is, who do you expect to step up here in May? You know, I think the the big guy to step up right now is Gabe Jacobo. He has just six hits and 73 at-bats, which uh, anybody that knows anything about baseball knows that that is a dreadful start. Uh, He's striking out a lot. He's not drawing a lot of walks. And he was probably our best hitter over the second half of the season last year. Uh, at the end of the year, he ended up a 10-game hitting streak to end the season uh, going out of the year until he got injured. When he was healthy last year, you couldn't get that guy out. Multiple hit games by the dozen. So he was really a, a big force last year. And now he's just had a, a terrible start. He's not hitting a lot of balls hard. It's not where it's just bad luck where he's hitting in the line drive double plays or anything. He's, I don't know if he's pulling off of things. It doesn't seem to be a big fu- a big fundamental or mechanical thing right now, talking with John Nunnally yesterday, but it's one of those things where he's really digging himself a big hole, and it's going to be hard to, to have a productive season for probably what's the first time that he's ever struggled hitting-wise in his career. Now, in terms of guys carrying us, uh, it's probably been a little bit different in different categories. John Birdie's been a big on-base guy, maybe not hitting for the highest average, but he gets on. He has great speed. He's already stolen 10 bases. Uh, Andy Burns is starting to come around a little bit with that speed and power combination. Michael Krause has really done a nice job the last two weeks of the season after the, you know, the, the acclimation, the double A finally took place. And then the two guys that carry us the most were the two double A veterans that you'd expect to two guys that could have or should have been in triple A Brad Glenn, who's with us now is homered in two of the last three. And then Ryan Schimp, who's up in triple A now, uh, after a solid year and a half with the Fisher Cats, he was hitting over 320. The average was up. The, the approach at the plate was a lot better, according to Nunnally. So those were the two guys that really carried us offensively. On the mounds, probably Deck McGuire, number one, and then number 1A is Casey Lawrence. Lawrence going tonight, ERA of two, doesn't hardly walk anybody. Three starts, he's walked one guy, and uh, he's done a really nice job, and we expect the same tonight. This is Tom Goff here with AA New Hampshire. Last question. A newcomer to your team is Matt Boyd. A lot of eyes were on him, especially how well he pitched in Dunedin. So how was his debut? Wasn't as bad as the final line looked like, but certainly wasn't as good as what he had done uh, when he was in Dunedin. I mean, I don't know how you get better than one run in 31 innings, but came out yesterday, and you could tell right away that he was a little bit nervous. He even said as much. Uh, we were rained out on Wednesday night, and he said, you know, it's probably good for me. I get a chance to kind of settle in and, and get rid of some of those nerves. Well, he still had a little bit of those nerves last night in his first double-A start. Not a guy that throws 95, so he really has to pitch to be effective. Had some good change-ups, Bobby Meacham said, and, and uh, he'll talk about that in our interview coming up here shortly. Said that he had some good change-ups. He had some uh, some good off-speed pitches. He did have some make some good pitches overall. A couple of dying quail hits in the first inning, and then a line drive double down the left field line. Gave him a, bit, a bigger double later on in that inning. But after that, he settled down. He threw a lot of pitches. 
But I think it was all, you know, not what you wouldn't expect in somebody's first double-A start for a guy that's uh, a little bit nervous coming up and a guy that doesn't throw 95 where he can just rely on pure gas to get guys out. He really has to pitch. And if you're not feeling your best, you're a little nervous, that's really tough to do. And a question from Bluebird Banter about A.J. Jimenez. How is he looking uh, behind the plate right now? A.J. Jimenez is looking really, really good. He uh, He's starting to hit the ball again. He hit a few balls hard over the weekend, nearly ripped the backside off the pitcher yesterday with a base hit off the middle of the line drive, and I joked around with him today about it, and he, and he laughed, and he said it almost got him, and I said it's a good thing it didn't because, you know, we needed those two runs, the two runs scored. If it hits that pitcher, who knows what happens. Maybe it gets stuck in his pocket and it's an out, or maybe it's a, a force out at the plate or whatever, but uh, hit the ball hard a few times yesterday. The, the most impressive thing was he's a catch-and-throw guy. He's a defensive catcher, and he made a throw yesterday. A uh, guy at first base stealing against uh, – Stealing against Matt Boyd, and from his knees, it was a pitch up and away, so he had to reach for it, stayed on his knees, threw a hose down the second base, and almost got the guy uh, who had a phenomenal jump. It was a, a really impressive throw, probably one of the most impressive I've seen A.J. make uh, in the year and a half, two years that he's been in New Hampshire. Only two guys have tried to steal on him in about ten games, so that tells you that the reputation is certainly still there. My gosh, yes. Uh, A.J. Jimenez and the New Hampshire Fisher Cats. Coming around playing strong, this is the man who gets to see them. Tom Gauthier with the New Hampshire Fisher Cats. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Till next week. I'm Jesse goldberg Strasser on Around the Nest. I'm the voice of the Lansing Lugnuts, along with Trey Wilson. And every single Friday, we get together with all the broadcasters in the Blue Jays organization, and we talk about what's going on all up and down the ladder, all the rungs of the system. So more questions about the Lansing Lugnuts. So we turn our attention to Lansing. Let me give you a brief progress report. The Lugnuts are now 13-13. and 13. Lansing began the season 4-11. and 11. Things were looking pretty poor. The starters, besides Kendall Graven, were not going deep into games. Graven was arguably the best starter in the league, and now he's received the promotion up to A-advanced Dan Eden. But everybody else was struggling, scuffling here and there, and putting forth performances that were unlike what they had shown in the past. Jeremy Gavariski broke out, put forth an eight-inning uh, showing, really strong the last homestand, and now he's getting help. The rest of the Lugnut starting rotation is getting stronger and stronger. I'll bet Serato, Tom Robson, and you can just look up and down. Chase the Young looks pretty good his last time as well. I welcome in Trey Wilson, who joins me for Lansing Lugnut games all season long. Trey, are you ready for some questions from Bluebird Banter? Yes, yeah, sir. Bring it. All right. So, a question. As you can hear, Trey is out and about in the city of Lansing. You can hear the siren behind him while I'm in the bowels of the stadium at the office. All right, so a question about <laughs> Mitch Ney's defense. Mitch Ney, according to a commenter who had heard, analysts have talked about the likelihood that he might have to move positions because he's not the best defender at third base, wondering what we've seen. Now, from my angle, I haven't seen that at all. How about you? Uh, Mitch Ney doing pretty well at third base. You know, a lot of people said that to me last year as well when we were down in Bluefield. I haven't seen anything to make me think that Mitch May is not capable of being an everyday third baseman. I mean, the errors that he makes are so rare. Every once in a while, he'll throw a ball up the line a little bit, trying to rush a throw. But other than that, there are there was a stretch at the beginning of last season in rookie ball where he would not get in front of some ground balls, some sharply hit ground balls. He tried to play them off to the side, Roger Dorn style. We've only seen that from him one time that I can think of this year. He's been, I mean, I would say above average in third base. If you had to ask, he makes some plays up the line or in the hole sometimes that are astonishing, especially because people have talked so poorly about his defensive skills. Maybe he was – I haven't seen any of his high school tape or high school scouting reports, but maybe he was a bad defender in high school. But at third base, at least in his pro career, and I have seen every single professional game that Mitch Ney has played, I can tell probably more than a lot of people, he is a very good defensive third baseman. Meanwhile, a question from Charlie Kasky on Twitter, wondering about Tom Robson. Charlie had heard that Tom was not working away, which he did all last year. Is Vince Horseman trying to get Robson to come in, uh, come inside the start? You know, I don't know if Vince has had anything specific said to Robson about location on the plate. I have been told and asking around that there are some things that they're working on with Tom that might be causing some problems, but I couldn't 
get any specifics out of anybody. There are a couple of mechanical things that I've noticed with him, but nothing major. He's he looked fine last time out, obviously, uh, and you you touched on that a little bit a moment ago. I think he's closer to being back to the normal Tom Robson, maybe just had some small adjustments to make with his delivery, and they're working through it. He's adjusting to it, whatever it is that they've had him do, and I think we're going to see him be just fine from here out. The last start wasn't quite Tom Robson-like still, but it was so much closer than anything else that we have seen from him this year. I think he's well on his way to being back to normal. From pitchers to batters, L.B. Dantzler has just joined the Lansing Lugnuts. What are your early impressions? Obviously, the guy's got power. Anybody who knows the name L.B. Dantzler associates that with either power or his you know, personality and his fish from back when he was at USC. But he's, he's had a hit in every game he's been with Lansing so far, I believe, and you know, just the, the four games in that last set. But he's added a new dynamic to the middle of the Lansing lineup, surrounded by Mitch Ney and Matt Dean. Those are three incredibly good bats to have at the heart of your order. And these guys could really benefit from it from a statistical standpoint because they're all going to have to see pitches at some point. Somebody's going to have to pitch to one of these guys, if not two or three of them, because of the protection around them in the order. LB is just um, – he makes it tough to set the lineup every day now with him here because there are so many good sticks all of a sudden that I guess it's, it's better to have too much than too few, though. So – We'll see how it plays out. And then from LB to DJ, DJ Davis is striking out at a 37% rate, has seen a significant drop in his walk rate. So what have you seen? Um, well, he's not recognizing off-speed pitches very well. He's not doesn't have a great recognition of the strike zone right now. But when he hits the ball, when he puts the ball in play, he's doing good things. He's hitting for power. He's He's driving in a lot of runs, and he's he's kind of been streaky. He and Dickie Dothan both have had a significant amount of strikeouts and uh, have been streaky at the plate. They'll get hot, they'll go a few games with a hit, and then they'll go a few games without. I think DJ struck out three times again last night. You're going to have that with Dickie Dothan, I mean, excuse me, with DJ Davis. You're going to have a lot of strikeout games with him for right now. He's still he's one of the youngest players on this team, and he's playing – and short, and or he's playing up in low A, so I don't think there's much to worry about. I think it'll be something that will correct itself with time and just see more pitches. Trey, something else, too. He is seeing good counts. He's working his way into deep counts. Just look at the, his at-bat against Aroldis Chapman. The count was worked full. It was 3-2, and two, and he took a fastball at, what, 98-99 at the knees to strike out, looking no shame in that. So maybe those walks aren't there yet. They're not there like they were in the past. But it's not like he's having bad at-bats recently. You know, honestly, I went back and saw the video of that today that MILB posted online, the clip from last night's Dayton broadcast, and I think that was a good take. I think he had ball four. It was a little bit below the knees on the replay, and maybe the home plate umpire couldn't see it because it's coming in there at 100 miles an hour. But uh, the strikeout for Davis yesterday, that's, uh, that, that's a tough – I mean, 90, 99 down at the knees, what are you going to do if you swing at it anyway? <laughs> it was a borderline pitch. Um, he worked a good at bat against Chapman. He fought off a two-strike pitch. But there have been some times where he's up and he has shown that he can battle and fight off two-strike pitches at the plate. And then there are other days where he comes up and he'll, he's down on three or four pitches. So it's a Jacqueline Hyde situation with DJ. And I, I think it's just going to – time cures a lot of things. And the more pitches that he sees – and the, the more time that he spends playing professional baseball, he's going to get better at picking up the off-speed pitches from guys, and he's going to get better at recognizing where his strike zone is. Is that question of young tools against old tools? Uh, young tools are things like speed, and old tools are things like plate discipline. That when you're young, you can be born with it, and he's got the speed, and so you can learn plate discipline. It's been fascinating for me to watch him work with roving hitting instructor Mike Barnett and hitting coach and Huckabee on that approach, on what to do up there at home plate, that we've already seen L.B. Dantzler, the college guy, he's got it down. D.J. Davis, age 19, drafted at age 17. He doesn't have it down yet, and so every single at-bat, they watch him so carefully to see, is he taking that step forward, those positive steps. We're one month in. 
I've got the feeling, and I asked John Tamargo Jr., the manager of the Lugnuts, all right, name me a player who's going to break out as this year goes along. And JT said, D.J. Davis, give him July. There are a lot of folks who think with the work that he's putting in this year and with the growth he's already shown that if he keeps on going in the direction that he's going, there are good things ahead for him, and those good things are not too far away. Yeah, I have no no concerns about DJ Davis long term as of right now. I don't think that I think it's just something that'll come along with time. More time working with Huck, more time working with Barney and everybody else that comes through here. He's gonna be just fine. Like you said, he's so young. Plenty of time left for DJ Davis. I don't think Jay's fans need to be too concerned. A lot of good luck for the Lansing Lug nuts, some bad luck too. Adonis Cardona has gone down with a freak injury. That's right. He had a he had to be removed from a start the other day with a a problem with his with his arm. Um, his velocity was down into the low 80s, so he's down in Florida. He's, I don't know what we are able to say on that. You probably know more of the uh, boundaries with that than I would right now. But yeah, it's tough luck for Adonis because he had made his numbers hadn't shown it. But looking at him from last year this year, he had come a long way. I mean, he still had a long way to go, but. He's he had made some serious strides this season from last season with his off speed, with his command, with getting ground balls instead of getting hard hit line drives. I think that it's just it's it's a terrible shame for Adonis to go down at, at this point in the season, especially the way that he started. Like I said, the numbers weren't there. Anybody who's just a a box score retweeter is, is going to make comments about Adonis Cardona would be surprised if they saw him in person right now and saw the – or up until this week and saw the improvements that he had made. Well, pitching coach Vince Horseman with the Lugnuts was speaking with reliever Adder Kelly and emphasizing what's the most important quality a pitcher can have? Courage. A pitcher has to be brave because any time you go out there to the mound, something bad might happen, whether it's a line drive right back at you like a roll this Chapman face, whether it's an injury, whether – who knows? It's the fear of failure. So you better go out there with courage, and if you have it, when something does come up, when an obstacle is placed in your way, that you don't lose that courage, that you say, no, this is worth it to me to persevere, get past this, and keep on working my way to where I want to be. That's, that's exactly right. And, um, you know, all you can do is go out there and not think about those things, just to take care of the task at hand and, um I think that we had seen some good progress with Cardona as well in working himself out of trouble when he got into it sometimes or when his fielders didn't pick up behind him. Um, it, when he comes back, when he gets healthy, I think that uh, you know he, he could very well be, if he can pick back up where he left off, I think he could be another one who will make more strides than people might have thought based on the first couple of years of his pro career. He's Trey Wilson. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler. We're the voices of the Lansing Lugnuts. We've gone around the nest, Jake talking about the Toronto Blue Jays organization, the single A level. And Trey, it's now time to answer our question of the week. And that is, April is now over. We are into May. So, who do you believe carried the Lugnuts through April? And the second part is, who do you expect to step up come May? Well, obviously, from a pitching standpoint. It would have to. It was Kendall Graveman. He was phenomenal the entire time that he was down here with Lansing. But you can't really say that a guy carried a team when he's only out there once every five or six days. Graveman was fantastic. If I had to pick an MVP, probably would be Graveman. But realistically, I think uh, Fitch Ney came up and showed no problems adjusting to moving up to a new level. And it's just been exactly as productive as he was a year ago in short season rookie ball. I mean, he's two levels higher on the, the total overall chain up the minor league ladder, and he has had no problem adjusting. And I, I rewatched his at bat yesterday uh, facing Aroldis Chapman. That's a not just a big league pitcher, that's an all star that he's facing on the mound. And Mitch May looked like a big leaguer facing him. I mean, he fought off a couple of tough pitches. There was one slider that he got a little bit uh, out in front on, but when you've got one of you're facing a guy with a 101 mile an hour fastball in that at bat and an 89 mile an hour slider, that's a lot of guys are going to look like that. I think that Mitch is so polished for his age and he's just moved right up here to Lansing and continued to produce, drove in a lot of runs, uh, took advantage of just about every RBI situation that he got. Um, Overall, day to day, 
he's probably the guy that I would have to say as an everyday player. There were a lot of other guys that contributed a lot. You think about guys like Jason Lebovigian and Derek Loveless and some of the things that they they did, even Jorge Saez. But none of these guys have been everyday players in the order. They've been they've gone through stretches where they started a few days in a row or – you know, they, they play three or four days, and then they have three days off or two out of three days off. Mitch Day's been a lineup every day, just about, and he's come out and produced every single time. Let me supplement your answer for who helped out the Lugnuts in April. The utility guys, Justin Atkinson, Jason Lebovician, and Dickie Joe Thon. And I know that Thon's numbers are not something that he would like his family members to look at yet. However, Thon moved from second base to left field. Dickie Jothan was a shortstop last year, so even the move to second base, that was big. You saw this earlier. You saw this last year with Matt Dean moving from third to first base. The players who move, who change positions, who say, okay, you can put my glove where you need it because I know you need my bat in the order, and this is for the team. In fact, Athan immediately went in and played left field after playing only one game in the outfield in his career. Jason Leblebegian playing all over the infield. Justin Atkinson playing all over the infield to supplement to allow other players those days off to rest. And I think now we're seeing the fruits of all of that come May. Now as players are adjusting, other guys are finding their groove. Well, in the early part of the season, John Tamargo Jr., the Lugnuts manager, did not have to rely too heavily on anyone at this position or that position simply would continue to shuffle the deck a little bit. You knew that Mitch Ney would be over at third, or D.J. Davis would be in center field, but there were days off to come by during some very cold and very wet and very windy nights. So I'll supplement you, because Mitch Ney and Kendall Graveman are really terrific answers. All right, who do you expect to step up in May? I think through May, looking at the the end of the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, looking at the end of the month of April, uh, Derek Loveless was really heating up. Um, he went through a little cold stretch at the end of the Dayton series. But if he's going to be an everyday outfielder in this lineup like he was most of April, and if he can keep producing the way that he did up until really the Dayton series, uh, he should be one of the guys that will maybe be the, one of the bigger surprises of this season. Um, I think Dawel Lugo is going to step up. We've all seen that he can hit, and he hasn't hit very much yet this year. So no. I – I don't think that there is uh, much doubt that he has some some ground to make up with the slow start to the year that he had, but everybody knows that he can hit the baseball. Lugo's batting 210. DJ Davis is hitting 208. Carlos Ramirez is hitting 191, and Dickie Jothan's hitting 217. On a team that's batting 256, and so all of those <laughs> numbers expect every single one of those batting averages to go up before too long. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I don't. I, I, I think we'll see DJ's strikeout numbers start to go down a bit more. But like you said earlier with the comments from JT, I don't think we'll really see DJ start to come around and tear everything up until maybe closer to midway through the year, um, maybe June or July. He's still got a lot of things to work out. But, you know, we'll see. <laughs> I'm not very good at predicting the future, so. <laughs> well, well hey, I'm not a scout. could very – May could very well also be the month of Alberto Torado, Tom Robson, Chase DeYoung, et cetera, Jeremy Gabariski. Starting rotation needed some help from the lineup early on, and now things could get fun. Chase DeYoung is another one I expect to see come a long way. I know his numbers haven't been spectacular. They've been decent but not great so far this year. But he looked so much better in that last outing. Unfortunately, it was rain short, and he only got to go three innings, and he gave up one run in that, so – it still in place the ERA a little bit, but I even talked to him the next day. He said he felt better on the mound and he felt more in control than he has all year, and it showed. So I think if that's some, there's something there for him, he could be really making some waves over the next month. You can find Trey Wilson on Twitter at Trey Wilson T R E Y W I L S O N seven five seven. I'm at Jay Goldstrass, LansingLugnuts.com for all the latest on the lugs. We thank Trey, also Al Hernandez with Dunedin, Tom Gauthier with AA New Hampshire, and Ben Wagner with the Buffalo Bison. We'll be back next week with your next edition of Around the Nest. For now, though, enjoy the baseball and have yourself a fine weekend.